Hi again from uh, Manchester. This this week has been probably one of the most remarkable and exciting weeks I've ever I've ever gone through. Uh, we had the first preview of our play this um, past Monday, and it was the first time we took all the work that we've been doing and put it in front of two thousand people. And I have to say there was no anxiety for me. I was curious about what might happen, but it wasn't anxiousness. It was a kind of, if anything, a kind of excitement, which may be the opposite side of anxiety. But it was pretty obvious from the moment the play started that we had an audience that really wanted us to succeed. They were with us from the first moment, and the applause was for every song, for every illusion that we have in the show, for the uh, arrival and disappearance of Oda May, who is a really wonderful comic character. And we, so we knew, we knew that they were loving it. At the end of the first act, they were cheering. And so we held our breath, sort of, for the end of the second act. At the end of the second act, they swooped onto their feet as a collective singular power of, of gratitude, if you will. And they expressed so much joy. They were screaming, yelling, clapping, whistling, stomping. It was like nothing I have ever experienced. It was a wave of energy that was completely and absolutely remarkable. And, of course, when you experience something like that, there's a kind of I guess euphoria, an enormous amount of sort of future projection of what this could mean and, you know, that you have a hit. I mean, the two people sitting in front of me who knew I was the writer turned around and kissed me. People all around me were saying, you've got a massive, major monster hit, you know, all that kind of stuff that you see in movies. And it was like I was living my own dream moment. I couldn't have dreamt it better than what was actually being scripted at that second. And I'd loved it. I loved it. And I decided to just give myself over to it, to be part of it, to feel the fullness of it. I was with Blanche and my oldest friend, one of my oldest friends, Larry, who had flown in from San Francisco, and his wife, and we were all just sitting in a row looking at each other in amazement at what we were experiencing. And the next day, I had a meeting with the director. And he had acknowledged that in all of his years in theater, he had never experienced anything like it. And there was a kind of urgency or tendency, if you will, to project this into the future as some kind of big event. And I could feel that. And he very quietly, <laughs> he put it very succinctly. He said, five. You have to see five. One event is not a total picture. We need to see five performances and see what we get. And I thought that was incredibly wise, the power of five, if you will. So you can take the average. I think in statistical practices they let go of the top and the bottom and they take everything in the middle. So I had no idea where we were, but I didn't think we could go any higher than that. And that proved to be the case. If you grave, grade on, you know, college a to F grading schedule, I, we, that was an A+. Plus. The next night was a kind of, uh, I guess you would call it a, a B+, plus, A-, minus, another standing ovation, another incredible exception, a, 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 a incredible um, reception. It was, it was really beautiful, but it was less, it was somehow less. And the, the next night was a little bit better, and the night after that was really not <laughs> not a very good show as far as I could tell. The audience, we, we were delayed 20 minutes starting because of technical difficulties, and I don't think the audience ever forgave us. We still got a standing ovation, but we were spoiled, and it wasn't the kind of eruption of excitement that we had had before. I would probably give it a B. And then last night, 
we had a uh, wonderful response, even though we had two technical breakdowns toward the end of the second act and uh, had to stop the show twice uh, for 10 minutes each. And I thought, well, the audience will never forgive us for this. But not only did they forgive us, they were in love with what they were seeing. And the, again, the, the enthusiasm was remarkable. So it was an extra, extraordinarily joyful to watch how this worked. And I remember on the third night and then the fourth night, when I looked at the director, we didn't speak, he just went. And the signal of three, four, and now five was so smart because when we weren't getting the same level of response to the second or the third show that we got the first show, I could feel something in me sinking. And I just thought, well, that's, that's crazy. It's crazy. Why, why, why feel that? And I was very simply able to let it go. And I, you know, I just, <laughs> I just let it go because this is a living thing. It's a work in progress. It is something that is evolving. And in truth, what I love about theater is it's always a work in progress. It's always evolving. It's very much like our lives. It's never done. And because it's like our lives, you can't grade one moment and say this is it. A life is a is many, 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 many moments. And ultimately they all cohere into something whole, something complete. And you don't know what you have at any point along the way as a measurement. It's the whole that is the measurement of a life. And we're all, most of us, it's still somewhere between midway and, in my case, a little further toward the end of a life. And what happens when you're, when you're in that is you start to look at the whole pattern. And the whole pattern is so instructive. It's so awakening. Because in the beginning and in the middle, you're struggling like mad to get somewhere. And you're trying to put all the pieces together. And you're measuring. And you're thinking, this moment means everything. And then two years later, it was just another moment whether it was good or bad. You know, some people have horrible experiences, some people have wonderful experiences. We all tend to have a mixture of both. But to think that one is defining or another is defining is not right. The de definition of a life is the whole, the whole life. And we're all in it. And the great value of a meditative life is that you get to step back from it. You get to step back and start to see, even midway, what the whole picture looks like, how it's going. It's like stepping away from a canvas that you're painting and looking at it and going, it needs this, it needs that. When you're right up close, you don't get it. You're working on the detail. And most of us are always in the detail. And very few people have a real perspective on their lives. And the extraordinary thing about meditation is it gives you perspective early on. Unlike waiting to the end of a life to look back over the whole, you can actually stop right in the middle and go two or three. And go, we're not there yet. We're not seeing the whole picture. And that's really a wonderful thing to be able to become aware of because then you don't have to make any final judgments. You don't have to think, oh, I'm a failure, oh, I'm this, I'm that. What you are is, is what you are. And that's an extraordinary thing. What you are is this collection of experiences, but you're also the thing that is aware of those experiences. And the value of really profound meditative experience is that you discover that which is observing, that which is watching the experiences accrue. And when you discover that, you start to know who you are. That's the joy. That's the amazement of human life. That you're not the experiences themselves. You are that which is partaking of the experience, witnessing, entering into and separating out of experience. You know, most people don't observe, they just are in it. They're just caught by the extraordinary, <clears throat> I love the word enchantment of it all. But what we really are is observers of enchantment. And we can separate from it. We can pull back. And pulling back gives you what we can call the same thing you get at the end of life, wisdom. So you can be midlife and have wisdom. Be wise about your choices, wise about how you're living, what you're doing who you are, what you care about, what you don't care about. It's really beautiful. What happens also from that still place is, is, really, is really remarkable. You find what we can only call inspiration. You find an, an attunement to the 
the muses, the thing in the universe that is the creative juice, and it comes through you. And there's no mind experiencing a kind of obstruction or resistance to it, it just comes through and you keep having a sense of what to do. And what I keep experiencing now, which is really a wonderful thing, is do this, do that, do this, do that. It just tells me what to do and I don't even think about restricting or, or, or resisting what I'm being told to do. I just do it. And every time it's right. Something told me last week, write a letter to everyone in the cast of this show and the entire crew, every one, and tell them how much you appreciate them and how much they mean to you. Because I really felt that. But in the past, I would never have written a letter to everybody. It's you're kind of putting yourself out there in a way, and to confessing how much you love people sometimes is complicated for them. But I said, screw it. I don't care. I love them. I really, truly love them. I, I have such a, an unbelievable appreciation for the amount of time, effort, creativity and brilliance and talent that these people have put into this. And so I just said, well, say it. And so I did. And you can imagine what happened. It was, it, it is still unbelievably beautiful. Everybody, I walk into the theater and I'm just hugged all day long by everyone, crew members, cast members. There must be 150 people. And, and, and they, sometimes they line up to hug me. And I go, wow, I have built an environment of love. And as I've said to you often, I think in my earlier talks, I've done it in many cases without doing anything, just being. Because the power of real being, the power of being present, is so enriching of an environment that I just sit and for a long time in the auditorium just that being there and just loving what's happening and smiling a lot, and being happy a lot, being, and people experienced it. And I have to say, I've watched hearts melt. I've watched hearts open, one after another, after another, after another. It's kind of one of the most remarkable things I've ever witnessed. And it's a test, testament to the power of being, because there was no Bruce doing anything, there was just Bruce being there. This being was there. And people were simply absorbing that. They didn't know what they were absorbing. There was, no, there was nothing there saying, hey, there's a fountain of love pouring into this, or, you know, to this space, or what I call it a fire hydrant of love. Nothing like that. They were just picking it up. Because one, it was in the environment, and two, it's in the, in the play itself. It's in the music, and it's in the words, and it's in the story and the concept. It's all there. Everything was feeding love into the environment and people were having such an extraordinary response and it doesn't seem to end. It's just unbelievably beautiful. And it's really how you can design a beautiful life. Somebody was complaining to me yesterday about how they weren't getting something from somebody in the crew. And, and the line that came to me, and of course you've all heard it, is give what you want to get. Don't just sit around going, why not, why don't they appreciate me or love me or understand me. Give them love, appreciation and understanding and perhaps it will come back. Maybe it won't, but I, I would pretty much guess that what you put out returns. And that's been my experience of the last uh, months on this journey. And the culmination of it on Monday night was unlike almost anything I've ever witnessed in my life. And it's a great thing to experience. It's a great thing to know. It's also a great thing that there's no ownership. <laughs> I don't feel an ownership of it. Matthew did, did something, the director did something on the opening night, which was pretty, pretty, pretty amazing because he's a very cool guy. He doesn't express a lot. He doesn't say hello when he walks in a room and doesn't say goodbye when he leaves. He's just, he's just there. And on the opening night, he got up in front of the whole auditorium and he said something really sweet about how this was a preview and things can go wrong and may go wrong and we hope it doesn't but be prepared to be you know understanding of what's happening and then when it was almost over he said I want you all to know that the writer of this play is sitting in the room and he said my name and then he looked very quietly in my direction and he said Bruce this is for you and you know my heart just broke but I have to tell you <laughs> 
It didn't break because it was about Bruce. I know it, you would think that would be the reaction. It broke because he was able to say that. Because he found that opening in himself that was so big and magnanimous and so loving and giving and that that is not the man I met when we first started working on this show. That was beautiful to me. His opening, his flowering, and it's really happening with him and huge numbers of people. That's the gift. That's the gift. Bruce doesn't need this. I've been around the block with this. You know, I see how it comes and goes and <laughs> when it means something and when it doesn't mean something and, you know, and it all fades away in the end. But what doesn't fade away, and I say it in the show itself, the love inside, you take it with you. That's what it's all about. That's the whole thing. It's the message of what's being put out there. And my God, people want to know that. People are hungry, hungry for the, uh, not the knowledge of this, but the experience of it, the knowing of it from it itself. And one of the things I love about this show is that it takes presence and it manifests it into the audience. And it's really, it's really wonderful. I know as I'm sitting here, I've held up my hand any number of times, and some of you are probably saying, what's that thing on his finger? <laughs> my family did that on Skype. This is a ring. It was given to me by Dave Stewart, who is the, uh, one of the, the composers for the show. And it's, it's a ring by somebody named Vivian Westwood, who I'd never heard of, but it's supposedly very famous here. And it's a lovely ring, but what it really is, is it's called a knuckle duster. And if you can see that, that you wear on your hands if you're going <laughs> to be entering combat somewhere. And it is what I call totally not Bruce. <laughs> it, is, it is the last thing I would ever wear. I, you know, I'm still getting used to wearing a wedding ring and it's been 40 some years, two or whatever years. Putting on a ring like this is really bizarre for me. And, and what I've come to love about this ring is that it is not Bruce. I love that I look down at my hand and I go, who is wearing that ring? I don't know that person. I don't know Bruce. And I love that. I love not knowing this. I love letting it be a mystery on a daily basis. I love the transformation of becoming something free of whatever it was I used to call Bruce. I'm telling you, it's a great, <laughs> it's a great thing. Do something different in your life. You know, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but find something that's not you and try it out. There's something very valuable about it. So, here I am in Manchester. I have two more weeks. I'll be coming back to L.A. on the uh, 14th of April and then uh, into New York around the end of the first week of May. So I'll be seeing every one of you who, who, wants, to, who wants to come and hear me talk about this stuff. And more importantly, maybe just sit, with me, sit in the same space of being. You know, it's, it's not my being. It's just being. But it's, when you're with someone who is present, who is in flow, it attracts your attention and it brings you into that same kind of stillness. And so the joy of being in a class, of course, is that you get to know exactly what I'm talking about, not through here, not by writing and taking notes, but by just sitting there and being in it. Because really, you're, you're never not in it, but you're just never usually aware that you're in it. So this is the opportunity to be in it, and I hope all of you who are hungry for that will come. Those of you who are already full, don't bother. Why, why drive an hour, two hours, or three hours that some of you do to, to be in it when you're already in it? But if you're feeling hungry and dis, dislocated or discombobulated in some way or distracted, then come, and we'll just sit together and be together. I love you all, and you know that. You know how much I love you, and I look forward to uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Be well. Remember the power of five. Don't judge anything by one event. It all works out in the end. Take good care.